And when I went to do the gene therapies, we, I did understand that I could die. Um, but I was willing to accept that over today's sick care system. Because we are learning the hallmarks of aging, where the targets are, we will definitively reverse those. It really is a mandate that people demand action here. is, as I said in the opening remarks, that biological age is modifiable, that death is not inevitable. And this may be just midway to facts, but all science begins with storytelling. And this is a fairly mature science. It may not already be happening, but The Economist recently published a story that said human beings living to 120, 150 is just round the corner. Mega really respected scientists in Harvard, uh, you know, and in MIT and elsewhere have already reversed blindness, diabetes, uh, arthritis, um, uh, you know, just the capacity to uh, hear, so deafness. All of this has been reversed individually. And now there's this idea that rather than attacking particular diseases, why not attack the root cause of age-related diseases, which is age itself. As I said, this blows one's mind in terms of sheer human ingenuity and science. It also blows one's mind in terms of its implications for society. And to discuss all of that, we have an absolutely fantastic speaker today, someone who calls herself the most genetically modified person on the planet. This is Liz Parrish, patient zero, possibly the only person on the planet who has injected herself with gene therapies that have not been cleared by the FDA because she believes that she would even risk her own death to push the science forward. To understand how mature this science is, whether, as I said, in its essence, it's possible, what is the controversy around placing yourself as patient zero, and what are its implications for society, We'll very soon be joined by Liz Parrish on stage. But before that, we again wanted to show a short window into the kind of imaginative and scientific realm that this is a doorway into. So, ladies and gentlemen.
Thank you so much for being here, Liz. Uh, and you're a perfect advertisement for age reversal. <laughs> I think we should start with a very, uh, you know, difficult test with the audience, which is to guess your age. Uh, <laughs> would you like me to do that? <laughs> oh, I'd like to take a couple more therapies first. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, you know, as I said, uh, Liz is really at the frontier of this because she's made her own body a uh, laboratory of sciences that have not yet been entirely tested or proven. So before we get into the real efficacy or the veracity of the science, Liz, yeah. I'd like to just start with a more personal story. Sure. Why did you even go down this path, you know, of making yourself a laboratory? What was your trigger? Well, actually, um, one thing that we can reflect on today before I get into my story is that over 110,000 people are dying right now. And those people could potentially be saved by the medicine that my company and other companies are making uh, that outstrips today's technology. So I want you to get that deeply ingrained in your brain, uh, that it's time for a change. But my story is actually um, the mother of necessity, literally. Uh, so in 2011, I started volunteering my time for the advocacy of regenerative medicine. I learned about stem cells and the epigenetics behind them, and I kind of fell in love with the genes that make stem cells different. So all the cells in your bodies have the same genes, but how they're expressed changes what they can do. So I spent ten, two years on that project, and in 2013, my son was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. And this was very hard, because not only was my own child sick with a pretty much incurable disease at that time, but I met a bunch of children who were sick, and some that were dying. And what I realized is that all of this medicine that I had read about and learned about that had been in advanced stages of uh, animal models was not translating to you, to my child, to those children. And so that's the beginning of my story. Right. So, you know, I also want to just share that in just a few minutes, we'll also bring on Sanjeev Galande, who's a, you know, genetics expert with Shivnadar University. But we just thought we'll get Liz's story out and then get the scientific conversation on it. Sure. So, uh, Liz, you said that your child was sick, but you then moved on to really looking at age reversal therapies. And there are a bouquet of uh, therapies or, you know, interventions that potentially could reverse age. Uh, George Church, who's on your board and who's a very esteemed geneticist at, yes. at Harvard, who brought down the cost of human genome mapping from $3 billion to $249, you that's know, right. so that's the level of his work. He also says that the science is real, it's mature, it's possible. Uh, it's been done on mice, it's been done on monkeys, but human beings are a completely different order, you know. So tell us, what is the, uh, out of this bouquet of 10, which are the ones that you picked? Why did you go to Columbia to do it? Why did you turn yourself into patient zero? And if it requires 10 or 12 interventions, why pick only two and what were they? Right, so in 2015, two years after my son's diagnosis and after researching the most promising genes that could treat both childhood diseases and biological aging, you're wondering why I shifted. Every company, every gene that my company chooses actually will also treat a childhood disease. And by treating biological aging, we treat the biggest medical unmet need on the planet, therefore expediting these therapies to children. So in 2015, the two most promising gene therapies to treat biological aging were telomerase reverse transcriptase that lengthens the caps at the ends of your chromosomes and folostatin that increases your muscle mass. Um, what these could do for an aging population is create more cellular divisions and more repair within the body. And folostatin can protect you against type 2 diabetes and about three different types of cancer. So we chose those because they were the most mature in evidence. And that's where we started. So today we don't have, when we look at treating aging, we look at the hallmarks of aging and there's 12 different things that are agreed upon scientifically that are happening at the cellular level. We don't yet have a gene for each one of those hallmarks, but the genes that we started with target the most amount. And then of course I went on to do more gene therapies after that in 2020. Right, so I'm, you know, I, uh, there was a bit of reverb, so I don't know if I, 
caught that entirely. But uh, the two things that Liz did take was the telomeres uh, rejuvenation, which is the ends of your uh, gene cells. Yeah, the caps at the ends of the chromosomes that shorten as your cells divide. Right. So you rejuvenated that, and yes. you also took a myostatin inhibitor, yes. which was you know, for muscle control and to rejuvenate that. Right. So the core idea here is not about gene editing, but it's about boosting uh, expression. You know, boosting therapies, expression of genes, so that you trick the cells into thinking that they're young yes. and it gets its repair factory kicks in. Yes. Is that the English version of this? <laughs> that is absolutely <laughs> correct. Right. So, uh, you know, what was your experience when you took it? You know, telomeres is also what leads to cancer because if you have uninhibited growth, uh, that could potentially be cancerous. So there was real danger in you taking this. What was your first reaction? And you know, how do you actually feel now that you've been taking this? I think this is your third round. Yeah, so when we first looked at telomerase reverse transcriptase, it, like a multitude of genes, is associated with cancer. But the truth is, it's not upregulated in all cancers, and there's sort of a divide in the research. There's the one research that goes and looks at cancer and the vast amount of genes that cancer expresses, and it's one of those. But if you induce telomerase, it seems to protect the organism against cancer. What causes cancer but cells getting old? Short telomeres lead to genomic instability. So we believe that by keeping your telomeres longer, we'll actually be able to, in the long run, prevent cancer. And we showed that in a paper that we published in PNAS, that we had no increased risk of cancer. It was probably one of three or four papers that are now out there on telomerase. But did you, you know, as I said, I'm going to bring Sanjeev on. I'm totally ill-equipped to, uh, you know, discuss the scientific veracity of any of this. But I just want to go with the emotions first. Right. That were you afraid? You know, what what was that experience of taking it? Well, I mean, every day my son has a chronic disease, so. If you read the literature and you realize that at that point we might be able to help 8 billion people, it was kind of we were at the precipice of no return. And when I went to do the gene therapies, we, I did understand that I could die. Um, but I was willing to accept that over today's sick care system. Um, we, we need reform. We need curative medicine. We need pre preventative medicine. Today, people wait until you get sick and they start treating the symptoms of disease. But if we can actually treat the cell at the genetic level, it revolutionizes everything. It changes the state of disease entirely. So how did that feel? Um, it felt like we were being part of history. Um, I can't say that it wasn't scary a little bit, but we were not going to turn back. And we will continue to push forward for everyone on this planet. Um, this, is, this is a mandate, you know? It's not easy to speak in front of a thousand people except for 140,000 people today will die needlessly. And that's 40 million people a year. And these people add value to the world. And, you know, we, we, we listened about AI. I'm here for biological relevance. With one single gene, Clotho, we can increase your IQ by a standard deviation. We've seen this in multiple patients in investigator-led studies out, outside of the US FDA, and we, that's reproducible. We need to be stronger, smarter, faster, and more impervious to disease. And what does that feel like? It feels amazing to be part of that. No matter how that ends for me, I am so happy to be here right now. Right. So, you know, there was a huge controversy when you went to Colombia to take these therapies because Maria Blasco, who was the scientist that really, you know, innovated on this telomeres therapy, she said this is really dangerous, should not be done. You know, uh, Jennifer Doudna, who came up with CRISPR technology, won the Nobel for it. She said that this is really dangerous because you're pushing the science too fast. Uh, you need the regulation. You need but you have a completely different philosophy on it, which is that you feel that those who are at end of life really facing uh, you know, very debilitating diseases, that they should have the right to take these therapies even if it ends in, you know, uh, in, in death. And there's another statistic which I'd like to share with the audience actually that uh, typically it takes $3 billion to turn one molecule into medicine. 
and I think David spoke about the fact that there's a 17-year gap from, uh, you know, from a medicine actually being identified and it reaching the bed. So th there are things on the other side, but you know, what do you respond to the fact that scientists themselves are very uncomfortable with what you did? I think a lot of the scientists were actually excited with what we did. Um, as far as stepping on the toes of people's grants and livelihoods, I can't speak to that. This medicine is for the people. I'm here to fight for their biological freedom. And I won't be stopped because, you know, it might step on the toes of somebody else's industry. These are your genes. You have the right to them. And, and I'm here to make sure that you get them affordably. So, you know, you have a... a you have a company called BioViva, you know, which mm -hmm. is also uh, backing these particular therapies. Right now, they're very expensive. You know, uh, some other statistic I read actually says it's three million dollars to get one injection. I think the one you took is a two hundred fifty thousand uh, dollars. These are like really risky therapies still because the science hasn't been proven. Uh, so, how do you cope with the ethics of others trying this? You know, you're making yourself a lab, uh, and that's a particular kind of courage. A particular kind of motivation which you've shared and you know I just want to share with you that Liz is very composed right now but this particular you know trigger of her own son being ill with a disease that possibly the solution already exists but is not available uh, when we first spoke it was her birthday and Liz actually broke down and really cried though this is you know like 13, 15 years since you discovered yeah. uh, that he's not well but it's still very real for you you know it's still very real I mean if disease and seeing your loved ones sick, especially your children, doesn't really shatter something inside of you. Um, that's questionable. I'm very emotional about this, and I think that that's what the world needs. I, need, I think that we need compassionate leaders now. We need to get away from the sycophants and the, the um, people who are driven by money, and we need to do what's right for the better of the planet, and that's feeling. We need to feel why we're doing these things. But Liz, I'm going to come back to the science of sure. it because we haven't gone enough into that. But Please. I just wanted to ask you again about the ethics of trying this out on others. You know, uh, uh, mm -hmm. what, what's your take on that? You've, I said you've turned yourself into a lab. That's okay. What about others? So right now, I spend most of my time on BioViva, but I spend about a third of it on regulations. And I actually work on regulations all over the world, trying to get terminally ill patients access to these new medicines. And um, so when you ask me about ethics, of, of, of the ethics of taking an experimental gene therapy, or the ethics of taking a therapy that treats a symptom of your disease that you know that you will die from, you will take that drug and you will die anyway. I mean, I think that this is where we split ethics wide open. What is the right thing to do? We actually have to spearhead new medicine and give people options to take it. What is a clinical trial but an experiment in humans that's sanctioned by a government? People die in clinical trials. So in medical tourism, we have seen zero deaths and zero severe adverse effects. In clinical trials in the US FDA in the last two years, six people have died of known toxic doses of gene therapy. Why did that happen? Because they don't have to have the same oversight as when a doctor and a company take responsibility for the treatment. We need to take responsibility for those treatments and give people access to safe technology, owning what the outcome is for them. I think that's a game changer. Right. You know, so I'm going to just draw Sanjeev Galande uh, onto the stage sure. because I'd like to know about the science of this and, you know, the competing arguments. Just one other question while he's coming on stage is that, uh, you know, there's also been a sort of lot of pushback on this from, one is the scienti scientists who are worrying about the speed at which you did this and without the, but the other is also about it getting independently verified, you know, so yeah. you've said that your telomeres have grown longer, yes. you know, that your biological uh, markers are now placing you at 25. In some areas, remember there's 12 hallmarks of aging, so my whole body is not in the 20s, I'm sort of a chimeric expression of gene therapy and how many cells we can transfect. So in my T lymphocytes, my telomeres are long. In my epigenetic 
genetics, my, my age is younger, but not all of my biological markers would be younger. I would still be suffering from glycation and other things that we haven't tackled yet. So we always have to be really careful of that story because the media will tell you one thing, but you really need to go, they call it, to the horse's mouth to, to learn the truth. Right, so I was just asking that if you would share with the audience the difficulty of getting peer-reviewed. You know, there has been oh, yeah. a lot of pushback on you. You're a woman at the frontiers of science doing something that does not have state sanction. Uh, mm -hmm. So there's been a lot of, uh, you know, talk and pushback and bad press, etc., around you. So, you know, I had asked you earlier that why not get this independently peer-reviewed and you'd shared how difficult this is. So I just wanted to share with the audience, you know, there's another Nobel laureate called uh, Barry Marshall who was looking at um, Helicobacter pylori. Right, um, for ulcers. What's the last word? Pylori, oh my gosh, I yeah, can't, yeah. You, it's, you've It's something. a really difficult word. Yeah. Uh, and there was nothing in his lab which was proving that, you know, that this bacteria uh, leads to a particular disease. And he actually then swallowed it himself to test it. Uh, breaking all rules of science, but eventually when he took it, it wasn't expressing in pigs, but he took it and within two weeks he came down, uh, you know, with the disease and it ended up getting him a Nobel laureate, uh, a Nobel. So I was just sharing that this is the sort of wild west of science and you're not getting peer reviewed at the level you'd like to, so do share that. And in the meantime, uh, you know, while you're thinking that through, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Sanjeev Galande on stage. <laughs> So as far as peer review, and welcome Sanjeev, um, we, we have been in PNAS for our new viral vector delivery methods, which are working to deliver multiple genes to cells. So today I took four gene therapies, and that would cost you four times as much because each one of the gene therapies with the most traditional uh, gene therapy method delivery today um, can only fit a small amount of genetic material. So now we're building larger vectors uh, so that it will cost you a fraction of the, the price to get gene therapies for complex disorders. Uh, as far as my own data, it was peer-reviewed, um, as well as a study that we did with patients with dementia, in which we did increase their cognitive ability, and we took this data to the US FDA, and they asked for us for about $3 million more worth of testing before we can get into a phase one, so if anyone has that in their pocket. <laughs> But we brought amazing data, but again, in, in my data and the dementia patients, because they were investigator-led studies, they weren't sanctioned by a government, we were not able to get into a major peer-reviewed journal. Um, there's a lot of uh, roadblocks to that, but we did publish anyway, we did release the data anyway, and we think that that's very important. Right. Uh, Sanjeev, I'd love to bring you in here. As you saw that I didn't have the temerity to get into the science of this. But, you, you know, what, what science is storytelling. So one, just at the level of ideas, this is crazy. Uh, but the fact that it's been proven in mice and in monkeys and reversing particular diseases. And George Church says that, you know, the fact that you can turn aging cells uh, back into stem cells, which are pluripotent and can go in any direction, that itself shows that you can reverse the age of cells. The dilemma is how do you do it in an in a, in a organism as complex as a human being? What's your take on it? You know, one, your assessment of uh, the things that Liz has done, is this efficacious science? And in its principle itself, is age reversal possible? So uh, I'll address the issue about gene therapy as a science and how it can be used for therapeutic purposes and I guess now is the time when the science has really matured for it to be applied to masses. Uh, in the 90s gene therapy evolved and uh, people did undergo some trials but they were not very uh, successful trials. But then the science has evolved in the last two decades where now we can tailor make therapies for individuals and therefore the chances of success are higher because we know that all individuals are not alike our genetic blueprint is different, our epigenetic blueprint is even far more different. So then one has to consider all these aspects while tailoring therapies of this kind to any individual. And that is happening now and I guess uh, companies like BioViva are at the forefront of that and there are many other uh, scientists who are also working day and night on trying to uh, uh, develop these technologies. 
And I um, should say, just I mean, just yeah. as a preface so that everyone in here understands, actually thousands of people have gone through gene therapies. And in the US alone, there are 11 approved gene therapies for monogenic disease, meaning a single gene mutation. Even most recently, CRISPR was approved for beta thalassemia and sickle cell disease. So, and that moved much faster uh, than the technologies that I took. The technologies that I took have been around literally for decades. So we, we, we didn't do actually anything new. We actually did something probably too late for billions of people. Right, but I'd like to ask both of you, you know, that what you're talking about is individualized diseases, you know, so where uh, you can have a delivery shuttle and again, we have Robert Langer, who's literally the master of precision drug delivery. So you need that gene therapy to go to a particular cell which is malfunctioning or where its expression is, you know, a, a, a sort of got debilitated. So that, I mean, given the sheer marvels of science going on, I get that, that that could happen. And David Sinclair, you know, again, someone that everyone's talking about, a scientist, uh, he says that he's discovered a chemical cocktail that can do that. Uh, but. Uh, so diseases, particular reversing blindness or diabetes or etc. But here there's a concept which is that age itself is a disease, you know. First, do you agree with that, uh, Sanjeev? And I'm going to come to the philosophical and societal questions. But do you agree with Liz? She categorically says age is a wasteful disease. And if we attack age, then all other diseases could be, uh, you know, fixed at one go. And George Church thinks that too. Are you going to put your reputation online to say that that's... Uh, a, a, a verifiable idea. So uh, I, I'm going to uh, bring everybody to the end point of aging, which is death. And I think that's a certain. So we cannot avoid death. We might prolong aging. We might prolong life. So that's, that's the way of looking at it. So you are basically providing ways by which people can prolong healthy living. And that prolongs the aging process. So I guess it's a different way of uh, putting the problem together. But that, that's a safe way of saying, uh, answering a question that I'm wanting a kind of headline out of, which is that to say longevity, you know, yeah. health span I get because barely 50, 70 years ago, health span was like an average age was 35, 55 because so many diseases could kill you. Yes. Now a lot of those with vaccines, etc., those diseases are sorted. So your lifespan now is at 70 or 80. That's not as mesmerizing an idea that you can extend lifespan, we got it. But can you reverse age? Like David Sinclair says in, a, in our lifetime that you could take a pill and you could reverse age, memory, brain, back to, and you can choose your age, you know, which is what our film was saying, like that you could stop at 16 or stop at 24, you know? So like I said, this is not done yet, but do you think it's a sound idea? I I'll ask that to both of you. Should I go first? Yes. Okay. So. Uh Definitely we can prolong aging with the current technologies and the kind of technologies that are being developed. In the next 10 years, I'm sure it will be pretty much feasible for everyone to prolong uh, their uh, healthy life. And of course, that means you can prolong aging process. Uh, with the chemical cocktails that you talked about, you're essentially rewiring, you're reprogramming your epigenome. And that is what it takes actually to prolong aging. Uh, You're still not using the word reverse aging. Prolong aging, I got it. Can you reverse aging? So uh, the kind of technologies that Liz is talking about using uh, telomerase-based uh, uh, therapeutics can reverse aging to some extent, but I'm not sure whether we can stall it that, okay, you want to stay 60 forever. That may not be feasible because you will slowly age no matter what because you can reverse, but then the clock is still ticking. You can reverse, but again, it will start ticking. You cannot stop the clock. That's right. what I was talking about. What do you have to say to that? Well, I think that we will definitively be able to reverse aging. Uh, we can already do it in human skin cells. We can take a cell from an 80-year-old and turn it um, into a youthful cell, or we can turn it all the way back uh, to a pluripotent stem cell. And so, doing that in a human body is kind of like a, a big engineering feat. The reason that this is important, um, you know, we can all in this room agree that we want to cure dementia. Um, we, we can agree that that's a terrible disease, but we actually can't cure dementia without reversing the cellular's 
the cellular age, or else, like you're saying, you'll end up dying of the disease anyway. The beta amyloid theory um, has been a cabal, and it's where a lot of people have gone to die. Um, if you want to question whether aging is a disease, if we cured all of cancer today, another disease that we can agree that we want to cure that goes up exponentially after the age of 65, if you cured all cancer, you would only live two to four years longer. And that's the whole population. And it's because this cellular aging is coming in and it's uh, ravaging your cells. Because we are learning the hallmarks of aging, where the targets are, we will definitively reverse those. It really is a mandate that people demand action here. COVID, we had a vaccine in 10 months. The gene therapies that I took had been known for over two decades. You know, we need to demand action and we need to get in there and that is what will get us to the steps of actually reversing biological aging in a safe way for everyone. But, you know, because you said we must demand this, it's going to open up the philosophical question, which is that one is that you said, you know, age is really disease related and they're heartbreaking diseases, you know, from dementia to all of that that we know about. So I get the emotional uh, need to possibly reverse age to stop it. But human life also has meaning because it's going to end. Uh, it has a sense of purpose. And like we said, you know, there are all the issues of that if you are able to reverse age, and scientists are really pushing on this, you know, you're pushing on it. What about overpopulation? What about the fact that, like I said, leaders will never die? You know, of all people, Elon Musk came up with this phrase. He said it would lead to the asphyxiation of society because there'd be no, you know, what would the young do if all of us could just reverse ourselves back to 16 and keep reliving our life in endless loops? And I asked David Sinclair that, does that also mean you can reverse your memories, you know? Is it that your body will reverse and your memories will remain? But he's recently started saying that memories can be reversed, your brain can be reversed. So you're basically almost like a movie, you know? It's like, I, I forget the name of that, where you just keep going back to a time. And you said, yes, you'll keep, the, the clock will tick. But you take a pill and you just go back. What are the societal implications of this? Well, imagine the value of a life if you were going to live for 300 years. Imagine how solving global warming and uh, space travel and resources and feeding the entire planet becomes more important. Not only that, we see a definitive trend in all of the countries in the world that as lifespan gains, birth rates go down. Uh, look at Japan, they have a, a lot of aging people that don't even have caretakers. This is a, a tragedy, you know, we need to help these people uh, become uh, capable. Uh, China has more people over the age of 60 than the entire population of the United States. And um, India itself has 149 million people as of the census in 2022. These are people that deserve life and, and they deserve to have the compassion to be, have life given to them. And that compassion in turn turns around into the next industrial revolution. How did the industrial revolution happen? It happened on the back of lifespan. That's how countries raise up. We have enough time to educate people and then enough time to um, create new technology. What we could do with this new technology and this new time, it, it's, it's very powerful. War, war would be an absolute absolute no-go. You couldn't kill our children anymore. Their value was too big. Liz, there's so much of this kind of utopic talking, you know, ar around science. And like I said, I, I mean, science is storytelling. It's fascinating. Uh, Vidita shared with me that in the Indian tradition, there's the idea of kaya kalpa, you know, that you can reverse age. But I'm just saying that there's a kind of easy moving between ideas that you're doing right now. Because one is about living longer, which, like you said, we get. Uh, that, but you're, you're talking about reversing it. So are you, talk, are you envisioning a planet where everyone can just live at age 25 or age 28? You don't want to grow old. So we're not talking about old, mature people. We're talking about a planet full of 25-year-olds, you know? Yeah, of course. We won't act like 25. You know, you don't want a bunch of people, you know. I, I mean, we will have a compiled um, an amount of understanding and development behind us. But you should walk into a room and everyone in that room should look biologically similar in age because aging is a very visual pathology. You all know the signs of aging. You all know them. 
And, um, and yet, that's not just happening on the outside, it's happening on the inside. When we look at brain scans of 85-year-olds that don't have dementia and compare them to a 25-year-old, they're, they're massively ravaged, you know? So all the way through, you should look younger. Sanju, I need your thoughts on that. But before that, I just wanted to ask the audience, uh, how many of you would reverse your age if you had an opportunity? Would you put your hands up? They don't want to wow. die of disease. It makes sense. You have lots of clients here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Liz is available over lunch, guys. <laughs> you know? But uh, Sanjeev, what is your thoughts on this? Yes, uh, I mean, it, I always look at the, uh, uh, both sides of the technology. And uh, just like uh, we found in this century, uh, because of prolonging age, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, lifespan of people, because of all the changes in the healthcare and medical sciences. Now, cancer is one of the leading causes of death. In the 19th century, that was not the case. Infectious diseases uh, took the lead, right? So we prolonged age and we discovered now that the cancer could be a problem and that posed so many problems to science and technologies. Now, if you prolong age to 150, 200, maybe some new disease or something else uh, neurologically or metabolically that will come up which will pose a new challenge to us. So one should be prepared while we are doing all this to extend the lifespan, we should also be prepared to deal with something new that may pop up and that will pose a medical threat. Well, I'm just going to leave. I hope this is just a jaw drop idea. There are two things being discussed here. One that we could live to 150. As I said, The Economist, you know, David Sinclair said the person who can live to 150 has already been born. That's how mature the science is. But that's about extending life and going older, which is still an organic way of life as we know it. The other proposition is that you can reverse life. And there are enough top-notch scientists and including entrepreneurial scientists like, not exactly scientists, but an entrepreneur like Liz saying that you can reverse age. Both those are fantastical ideas. Uh, if you go into the science even a little bit, what it leaves in me at least, apart from all the philosophical questions, is the sheer marvel of the way that scientists are being able to come down to literally investigating the cellular levels at which our organisms work, you know, from caloric shock to epigenetic rejuvenation to myostatin inhibitors or mitochondrial rejuvenators. I mean, just the fact that this extremely mysterious thing that we thought was life is now like a disembodied car that you can fix with the mechanics of scientists is something that one should really be humble about. But certainly, again, society needs to engage with this because I'm not sure what a world full of 25-year-olds would feel like, you know. But in the meantime, we have Exhibit A. And thank you very, very much for being here, Liz and Sanjeev. It's been a real pleasure talking to both of you. Thank you very much. And let's ensure that we don't leave our children with the same diseases that we die from today. <laughs>